Welcome to Coffee with Cornelius. We are frequently told that education is important for us to get ahead. And this may be true, but does a formal education mm -hmm. actually educate us? Does it improve our intellect? Does it shape and mold our sense of the world? Or does it just shape us into compliant corporate drones? Joining me to discuss this and other topics is Dr. Herb Gintis. Dr. Gintis is external professor at the Santa Fe Institute. And although he has trained as an economist, he went to Harvard. He finished his PhD in the subject in 1969. He has diverse research interests, including sociobiology, game theory, education, anthropology, political philosophy, you name it. When it comes to social sciences, Dr. Gintis has his foot in the door of some of it, at least. His most recent book is Individuality and Entanglement, The Moral and Material Bases of Social Life from Princeton University Press, 2016. Dr. Gintis, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. So much of what we are going to be talking about comes from your book with Samuel Bowles, a frequent collaborator of yours. And that book is Schooling in Capitalist America. You mention in the preface of the book that your collaboration was instigated at a request from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who wanted you to come both to prepare background papers for the Poor People's March on Washington. Could you tell us a little bit about this and why did Dr. King approach you and what background papers did you present? Well, uh, Dr. King contacted Samuel Bowles, my co-author, and uh, Samuel Bowles enlisted me in the project. Um, uh, Dr. King wanted us, us to explain to him Mm -hmm. what the economics of social change was and what the position of minorities, especially black Americans mm -hmm. was at the time, in particular, um, social mobility. What chances do people, they come from a low social uh, background, that is low income social status, of ha having their kids move up in the world. Um, and he wanted to know what good I would say demands, because he was part of a movement, demands to, that could be made on the uh, American society that would improve the position of minority uh, people, especially blacks. At that time, it was almost exclusively blacks. So uh, he, I do not know whether he contacted any so-called mainstream economists, but Samuel Bowles and I were not. We were called radical economists. We were teaching at Harvard, and... Uh, we had, because of the war in Vietnam, we were bitterly, bitterly opposed to uh, most uh, standard thought processes, including my own PhD dissertation director and lots of the other professors that we had. They all worked for the CIA. They went to Vietnam and, uh, and, and consulted with, uh, you know, the, the administration and the enemy. I called the enemy. So we were very, very upset. Now, of course, with the coronavirus, we now know you can really be upset. Sure. We were upset just because there were 300 Americans a day coming home in body bags. Wow. And so it radicalized us. We were young people. We were seeing the United States bashing these uh, peasants in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So we were very much um, on the outs with that traditional... Uh, e economics. Now, it's not to say that all of my professors were that way. They were not. John Kenneth Galbraith, I mean, I could name five or six who were definitely on our side. And when it came time to promote us, for instance, I was when I was promoted to associate professor, it's because these people who agreed with us, um, uh, it forced the department to be uh, level-headed in uh, and, and kind of meritocratic in their appointments. So at any rate, Dr. Dr. King knew this, and he wanted input from the alternatives. For instance, we, we taught a course at Harvard called SOCSI 128. It had hundreds of students, and we did it for year after year. So we were pretty much up on alternatives to traditional economic theory, which, by the way, tended to say there's a huge amount of mobility in America. Um, and he asked us to, um, uh, to pro pro provide an alternative, if there was one, and mm -hmm. we did. We, we started studying income distribution and, we, and studying mobility. By mobility, I mean, if you're in the top 10% of parent parental income, 
what's the chance that you're going to be in the top percent, 10%? Mm -hmm. If you're in the bottom 10%, what's the chance you're going to get to the top percent? So we studied all of that stuff. And our conclusion, um, our conclusion was that um, America had very little, very little mobility. Now it had some mobility for sure. Lots of people from all parts of the income distribution have kids that go to the other old parts. But mostly, if, you're, if your parents are in the top 10%, your chances of being in the top 10% are 20 times that of someone who comes from the bottom 20%. So that's why he was interested. He wanted to know uh, uh, numbers like that. So that's it. Oh, I see. So, and we, and I mean, we provided a single yeah. um, uh, uh, report. Right. Laying a bunch of stuff out. Now, I haven't seen that report for 50 years, but <laughs> it was there. So it's somewhere in the archives. I've got to ask it may a question. Be or may not, it may not even exist. Oh. I don't know. Yes. Oh, hopefully it does. I mean, one question I, I would like to ask, though, what you make it sound like is that at the time, economists, there was hardly any work being done on these questions of, of social status and social mobility. Is that a fair characterization of the economics I, profession I wouldn't at the time? say that. I would yeah. say there was work done on it, yeah. but it was done with a bias towards America being the melting pot that everyone's pretty much equal. Now, here's the real uh, problem. Whenever you do statistical analysis like this, there are errors in the numbers. Mm -hmm. And if you don't correct for the errors in reporting, for instance, if someone says, um, you say, what was your parents' income? How do you know what your parents' income? Well, I don't know what my parents' income is. <laughs> yeah, sure. What am I going to say? Yeah. You know, there's so much error in that. Yeah. That um, if you just use the gross statistics that people give you, you get a very low correlation between mm -hmm. parental success and children's success. Yeah. So what we did was we found the so-called validity of the reported. I mean, it's a statistical technique which allows you to factor out. Like if 50% of the answer is wrong or random, you'd factor out 50%. Mm -hmm. So we got a figure that was very high. Like uh, that is social mobility was very low. And we got roundly criticized for that. But I'll tell you this, later researchers not only corroborated our work and mainstream researchers, but they showed it was even worse than we thought. And they did that in a variety of ways. James Heckman mm -hmm. at, at the University of Chicago got a Nobel Prize for the work he did That's right. on intergenerational mobility. And it totally supported everything we said. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's very sad. There should be more mobility. But, but people in the upper classes, they don't want mobility. I, for instance, I, I don't want my kid to have an equal chance with every other kid in the world. I want to give them a good chance. Right. So there's yeah. a, a, a incredible pressure for lowering the degree of, of uh, mobility in society. So let's talk about the main thesis behind schooling in capitalist America. Could you just let my listeners know what the main thesis is? Yeah, well, we have really um, <coughs> several, several themes. Mm -hmm. One theme was there's low mobility in America. It's not... Sure a Horatio Alger thing where anybody can be anything. It's relatively low mobility. Uh, we had what we call the correspondence principle, which is this. Oh, no, no, let me say, first of all, let me say, very important, I did my PhD thesis on this, to show that what you get when you go to school is not only higher skills, but also a new personality. Mm -hmm. And a personality, and schools tend to produce people who fit into the economic system. Right. Why not? What do you expect? That means that working class schools teach people to take orders. Mm -hmm. And um, elite schools give kids a lot of leeway and choices of courses and, and the study times. And poor kids get the shaft all the time. Um, so that was called the correspondence principle. We had all sorts of statistics to show that it was true. Mm -hmm. And the third thing was that schools don't just give you skills. They give you what we call affective traits, personality traits, that is, and, and your success. That is, the, your grades in school and your probability of moving on to a higher level 
depends on you internalizing, it's a sociological term, internalizing the norms appropriate to that level. Mm -hmm. And we had lots of statistics, as I said, my dissertation uh, tr tried to prove that using personality tests and other, uh, uh, other means from psychology. By the way, I should say that all my life I've been, I've worked in all fields in behavioral science. I'm not just an economist. I know psychology, political theory, sociology, and I've even published extensively in anthropology. And I think you need all of these to really understand society. If sure. you really want to understand, you can't stick to one discipline. Sure, and I, I, I would agree with you. Uh, there, I mean, I guess it's where the question leads you, right? Where the question leads you exactly. could could be in a in a direction that's not purely economic. Um, but these affective traits that you're talking about in students that schools instill in students uh, are they necessarily affective traits that we should be concerned with, or are they purely benign? Well, uh, th these are value judgments. Mm -hmm. um, working class parents want their kids to be disciplined. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing they want. I mean, there's, yeah. again, I'm speaking because I have evidence. I don't believe anything without evidence. I say sure. nothing without evidence. The evidence is that working class parents really want their kids to learn to be disciplined. Mm -hmm. And they are happy when the schools do exactly that. And more upper class or upper middle class parents want their kids to be, have self-direction. And they want yeah. them to be reflective and self-reflective. So they prefer schools that aren't purely disciplined. They give kids the, the skills they need to like operate at a high level in a corporate structure or to start an entrepreneurial business or something like that, or go into a profession like law or, or uh, medicine. So um, these are just different ways of being. Now, I am an upper class person. My parents, my father was successful as a businessman. He was a small furniture dealer. And I swear, he, ra he and my mom raised me and my brother to be just like what I'm saying for the elite. That is <laughs> sure. They didn't discipline us. One, one time I was caught stealing when I was 12 years old. And the shopkeeper called my dad at work. And when I went, to, when I went home, I was so scared. My dad was crying. He didn't hit me. He wow. cried. How can I ever forget <laughs> making my dad cry? Sure, yeah. That's even worse in some ways. Yeah. Oh, it was terrible. Yeah. <laughs> he then, by the way, I should say this. He said, for the next four years, you're going to be driving a truck uh, for me in summers when you're in school. And I did that. Oh, I, was, okay. I delivered furniture for four years. Wow. So there was some discipline there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, but it was constructive discipline. It wasn't yeah. going to beat the crap out of you. Sure. So it's a value judgment. But, mm -hmm. we, you know, I think being raised to be self-reliant and tolerant of others and all that kind of stuff is really wonderful. Yeah. And um, I'm so glad that my parents gave that to me. So I would say, yes, it's better to be in the middle class rather than the working mm -hmm. class environment. But if you're going to go get a job on an assembly line, or if you're going to have a boss who's, a, excuse the expression, an a-hole of some kind, mm -hmm. you better be, be able to take orders and not hit him in the mouth. True. You hit him in the mouth, you lose your yeah. job. So these are what things we did in our book. Um, and, and we did these with statistics and a, and a lot of evidence. As I say, I don't believe anything unless there's evidence. And these effective traits can definitely dampen social mobility. Now, schooling was published in 1976, and a lot has changed since then. And you've already alluded to this. You know, you talked about James Heckman and a few other studies. Right. Uh, can you give us some more examples of how these conclusions might still hold true today? I know you have a 2011 version of the book, uh, but, you know, how, do, do these uh, conclusions still hold today? Well, after 20 years mm -hmm. later, 1996, I think, or 25, 2001, yeah. Sociologists probably love that book. They all, everyone who's studied sociology gets to read our book. It's a, it's a classic. So a bunch of sociological co conferences asked us to speak. What's happening now? You know, like, you know Bowles and Gintis after 25 years or uh, capitalists and um, 
School of Capitalist America a quarter century later. And we went back and read what we said. And we compared it to what we knew now. Mm -hmm. And we had a general conclusion. The empirical type statements we made, everything I've said to you so far, has been validated. As I say, James Heffman, but also um, uh, Christopher Jenks at Harvard showed that the affective traits are the ones that really matter too. Mm. So, you know, and the in income distribution, we, had, we did a book called Unequal Chances, Princeton University about 2012 or something. I don't remember the year. And we had a big conference at the Santa Fe Institute in, in, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, which is where I'm a member. And we had the experts in the world who do mobility studies. You know, that's all they do is mobility studies. Perfectly. I mean, I'm sad to say, I wish there were more mobility, but there mm -hmm. isn't. Um, it's just a mess. So we were not unhappy with anything we said empirically. Um, but we thought there was a better system, socialism. There so, isn't a better system, so there's no panacea to this There's no problem. panacea, but there is a way to improve. Some, some places have better schools than others. You can improve the schools a lot. But we were into socialism, and if you want to talk about that at some point, we can talk about it. But the point is, we, 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 thought, we now think that just no, there is no alternative. Now, people today, I notice, I'm very attuned to this. People today say, well, I'm a democratic socialist. Mm -hmm. I said, well, what do you mean by that? And then they say something perfectly liberal. Like yeah. I think the ruling, where the, the upper class shouldn't have so much money. I said, oh, really? That's a system change? You know? <laughs> Mark yeah. said, you bash the capitalists, you take the money. You yeah, give it to sure. the state and they run the economy. <laughs> oh, no, you, you have to give them less power. You know, and We have to have more welfare states. Yeah. Really, that's socialism? Come on. It's a farce. There are no socialists in that mm -hmm. anymore. So at any rate, we were wrong about that. And when I think, and it was a long process of figuring out that we were wrong. Why? Because first of all, we adhere to what was called market socialism. Okay. Market socialism is the, the government owns the capital stock, the mm -hmm. wealth. But all firms operate on markets. They buy and sell and they make profits and all that stuff. Sure. Now, I'm not going to go into why, but that doesn't work. Okay. It's a long, long story. And then we moved to what we call democratic mm -hmm. uh, socialism, which was the worker ownership. For workers own the firms. And we spent 10 years on that, or maybe eight years, until we figured out that that doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work, basically, is that capital is... The, the reason corporations and businesses work is they have limited liability and they can mm -hmm. borrow. Sure. And um, they borrow because they have collateral, capital, background. Workers are poor. The only, the only wealth that most workers have is their house and their car. Mm -hmm. And they're lucky. They're not, they don't get their house until they're like 55 years old. Yeah. Mortgaged. So they can't, they can't raise capital. They can't compare. And then we said, well, what if we just give the workers the firms? Mm -hmm. Just give it to them. Answer, they'll sell it. <laughs> sure, yeah, they can make a lot more they money. Get more money by selling yeah. it than they am by running it. And so, so you have the same rate, problem, yeah. So there's your answer to, to what the problem, the only problem with schooling in capitalist America was we said we can solve all this if we have socialism, but we were wrong. You mentioned that there are reforms that can be put in place that would make the system function better. Would something like school choice or something like a voucher system be a good idea? Well, we know... We, I have supported school choice for many years. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important. But you know who it's important for? It's important for the poor. Right. Um, if you're in a middle class school in, you know, Lexington, Kentucky or something, you get a fine education. But if you're in the center, uh, center city of Detroit, you get a, an inferior education. And that's because the public school, the way the public schools work, um, they shovel all the bad teachers and the miscreant teachers into the poor schools. And the poor schools should have the best teachers. They need the best teachers mm -hmm. because they have lots of problems. I mean, yeah. the poor aren't poor for no reason at all. Mm -hmm. There's a lots of behavioral problems. Sure. That you don't, I, taught, I taught at Harvard and the University of Massachusetts and NYU and Columbia. I never had a student 
talk back to me. Mm-hmm. Never. I never had a parent call me and yell at me or do anything else <laughs> other than invite me to dinner. But if you go to a poor school, and by the way, I, my, my, my son's girlfriend was a teacher in um, Queens. Mm-hmm. She said the real problem was there's a lot of kids. I, I had to deal with the d- discipline problems, and I couldn't teach the kids who were wanting to learn. Yeah. So there are discipline problems, and it's very real, but you need really good teachers. And when you mm-hmm. get them, there's all sorts of evidence that you can have kids, with, uh, schools with poor kids that do really well if they have very talented principals and committed teachers. Yeah. But the point is, most teachers get burned out after a couple of years. Yeah. It's hard work and it's yeah. unrewarding work. And you get yelled at all the time for, mm-hmm. you know, doing everything under the sun. So it's very, very hard. But it can be done, yes. And I d- definitely support. And by the way, um, charter schools and, and, and choice in education, it doesn't just help the, the people who get the choice. It helps the public schools too. Mm-hmm. Because they have, they have to account for the fact that there's a school up there doing better than you. What yeah. are you going to do about it? If there's no comparison, what can you say? Well, there's, the kids are poor, they're dumb, whatever. <laughs> right, yeah. But if you can say, well, the same kids are up there on the street yeah. there, and they're, they're getting into college. Mm-hmm. See, so... So, so there's a competition that is generally... Competition yeah. is good for... Competition is good, in, in, and that's what economists will tell you, and it's mm-hmm. true. Okay, all of our social life is an interaction between cooperation and competition. Yeah. And if you just have one, it's bad. You have to have both. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a general message from all the game theory that uh, I've been you know, working well, on for years. That's a fantastic leadway because I'd like to talk about game theory. You have a wonderful book and I highly recommend it to our viewers. It's called Game Theory Evolving. It served me well in grad school and it's great because it's got practice problems. It's got solutions in the back. It's got some programming exercises for those who are interested in computer programming. Um, but for those of my viewers who do not know what we're talking about, what is game theory? Well, I, I should start out. I mean, game theory, I should start out by saying what's decision theory. Sure, Which, yeah. Now, decision theory is how do you predict what someone will do when they're faced with a choice of a number of options, each with a certain probability and each with a certain probable outcome. Mm -hmm. But that's one individual. It's well-developed. For instance, Daniel Kahneman got a Nobel Prize in economics for Mm -hmm. his work on decision theory a few years ago. Um, And by the way, it's not just applied to humans. It's applied to all animals. Okay? All animals. If you want to say an animal behavior, you're going to study decision theory. Hmm. How does a bee decide where to go to get the, the uh, honey, mm-hmm. to get the pollen? How does he decide? Here's a choice. You can have a field that's very sparse, but whenever you find a flower, it's got a ton of a pollen on it. Hmm. Pollen. Or you can have one which has flowers all over the place, but each one has a very little bit of po- pollen on it. Which one do you go to? That's a, 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 and bees solve that problem optimally to get the most amount of pollen they can get. So this is not just humans. And when people go around and say, well, decision theory assumes you're rational and nobody's rational. That's just pure bunk. We didn't get where we are as a species and bees didn't get where they are by being irrational. They got where they are because they're rational and they reproduce well and they feed themselves and they have good kids who go on to produce more <laughs> kids. So decision theory is absolutely central. Um, But then game theory happens when instead of facing nature, like a choice set, you're facing other people. And we're all trying to get certain things done. We all have certain goals, but we're thwarting each other. We can cooperate, we can compete, but I have to take into account what you are likely to do when I decide what I am likely to do. Mm -hmm. That's game theory. So game theory, game theory doesn't predict anything. It's like algebra or calculus or something. It's just a mathematical, uh, mathematical structure. And you have to feed in the content, just like an algebra. You have to say, well, there are four birds on a wall and blah, blah. The algebra doesn't produce, predict anything. It's just Mm -hmm. a tool. The game theory tools are, first of all, you have players, 
and you have rules of the game that they have to follow, and you have payoffs. So that when he, and you have strategies. Each player has has to have some strategy, and then when each player makes a choice of an action, there's a payoff to each person. Mm-hmm. And and that's game theory. Uh, let, you want me to give you an example? Yeah, please do for my viewers because uh, that would be yeah, helpful. It's very yeah. abstract. Yeah. Here's an example. Because I love this example. Uh, because I'm, I'm, by the way, what they call a behavioral economist. That means mm-hmm. I think that the way you find out how people are is by studying them in the laboratory and in the field, right. not by abstractly positing that they're mm-hmm. this or that. It's called the ultimatum game. The experimenter takes two subjects that don't know each other, or at least they never see each other. They're in different rooms. And the experimenter says, I'm going to give you, I'm going to call you the proposer. I'm going to give you $10. And there's a guy over there in the other room called the responder. And he can, and you, you can offer him anyone, anything from one to $10. Mm -hmm. And if he accepts it, you split the money that way. So if he, if you say, I offer you $5, and he says, okay, he gets five, you get five. If I say, if I offer you $2, if you accept, you get two and I get eight. Mm-hmm. But if he rejects it, we both get nothing. Yeah. That's what, okay. So here's the, the game. There are two players, proposer and responder. There are the rules, which the proposer offers a certain amount of money to the responder. And the responder can only say, I accept, I reject. And the payoffs are, as I just suggested, game. Now, the question is, how do people play this game? Mm-hmm. Now, if you're an old-fashioned economist where everybody's selfish, the proposer will offer them $1, and the responder will say, well, $1 is better than nothing, so I'll accept. Yeah. <laughs> All around the world, it doesn't happen that way. Yeah. Responders offer $5 or $4, and a re- I'm sorry, proposers offer that, and responders accept. If they offer $3, not a good idea. A lot of people Mm -hmm. will reject $3. And by the way, you can do the experiment where the amount of money is three months' salary. Mm -hmm. Same thing. In fact, even more so. So farmers who make, you know, $1,000 a month, if you play $1,000, I'm sorry, $1,000 in three months, if you play a game with them for $1,000, they'll reject $300. A whole month's salary. So at any rate, the, that's one one reason game theory is so wonderful. It, it lets us figure out how people behave in, abs, in abstract situations so that we can see exactly what they're doing and, and uh, unaffected by, is this my brother-in-law? Is somebody going to find out? Well, you know, whatever. But the, what, what you're saying essentially is that the way people behave in the laboratory, even with very large sums of money, which is fascinating. I think that was an Indonesian experiment. I could be wrong. Oh, but, yeah. yeah um, uh, what you're saying is that they act in a way that is different from the way game theory would predict that they would act. Is, is that I right? Said, this this, this yeah. is something which is a very common, I, I don't mean to criticize you, but it's a very common, yeah, sure. I would say, mistake. Game theory doesn't predict anything. Mm-hmm. Game theory is like algebra. It doesn't predict anything. Okay. It's a structure right. for putting in you know, variables, mm-hmm. number of players, rules of the game, payoffs, probabilities, blah, blah. And then cranking out how you think and preferences of the players, for instance. Yeah. And then trying to predict what they're going to do. So game theory doesn't predict anything. If you're selfish, only care about your own outcome, then game theory can often very, predict right, very yeah. well. I see but what you're saying. people are yeah. not generally selfish. People are both generous and vindictive and vindictive is very important people are very vindictive in in these experiments for instance if you do if you if you cross them and you do something that hurts them they will pay money to hurt you back even though they'll never see you in their lives in fact that's what the ultimatum game is why do i re- why do i reject a dollar because i'm going to shaft you you dumbass you're getting nine dollars i'm getting one i'm going to take your nine dollars and it's only going to cost me a dollar yeah when i go home i'm going to think how sweet it was yeah (laughs) yeah sure and i I, so i guess what you're saying is that you know in game theory what we can do is we can structure people's preferences 
uh, such that, you know, they do care about things like inequality or inequality well, uh, aversion or, right. yeah. yeah. But I don't, I don't want to say we can structure them. We find out how they in fact behave. Sure, yeah. You know, yeah. It, it, this is experimental, just like it was right. physics or chemistry. You know, it's mm. called behavioral because we study the behavior and we find out things that, you know, no one has ever, if you read a sociology book. Yeah. You're not, not going to find anything about being, being, being retributive or vindictive or anything mm. like that. But I love to tell my students, I used to tell my students, there are two kinds of movies. They're love movies and they're revenge movies. <laughs> okay. Now, we all know why uh, I really love movies great. Yeah. When you get a good Schwarzenegger, you know, he, they kill his wife and dog. And the whole movie is him killing everybody in sight. And he cries. Oh, that was a wonderful it's pretty great, That's like the John Wick inspiring. movies. <laughs> they love yeah. that. They love revenge. Yeah. So we found out things by using game theory to find out how people behave that we never even thought about before. I always thought, revenge, that's stupid. Who would do a yeah. thing like that? That's a bad personality. Mm -hmm. But everybody's that way. I mean, there's, not everybody, but I mean, the majority, most, large majority of people are that way. So, so this so anyway, that's what game theory is. But I should yeah. mention that this is not just about humans. Mm -hmm. And it's the games that people play for humans are often called social games. That is right. the rules of the game in society. You know, wear a tie and a necktie when you go for a job interview, all mm -hmm. sorts of stuff. But for animals, all of animal behavior theory today is uh, uses game theory. If you want to find out how long a dung beetle is going to stay on a hot cow patty, you can model it game theoretically mm -hmm. and see and see how long you should do it and then see if he does that. And yeah. they do do that. So uh, game theory is so central. I study physics a lot. That's what I've been mostly working with for the past four years. In physics and chemistry and geology and archaeology, I'm sorry, forget about that. There are no games. Right. Game theory is completely absent from physics and chemistry because electrons and protons don't have goals yeah they don't they don't try to achieve certain ends for themselves like more money or more power or more mm. equality or whatever so there's no use for game theory and they, it isn't there as far as i've never found anything game theoretic in my study of you know uh quantum mechanics or quantum mm. field theory or relativity or uh hydrodynamics or anything it's purely a behavioral uh, yes, but component. you know, I want yeah. to tell you, it changed my life. Mm -hmm. I used to be a Marxist, and uh, that was wrong, unfortunately. I mean, mm -hmm. I, loved, I loved Marx at the time. I don't think much of him anymore, to tell the truth. But when I learned game theory, it like opened up the world for me. Mm -hmm. And I think it can do it for a lot of people. I, I would agree. If, they have to be analytically minded. Yeah. Anyway. And uh, you have to be, not be afraid of equations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I teach a game theory course and I find that with the students, they come out of it thinking somewhat differently than they did when they come into it, even if they were economic students, you know, even yeah. if they're, uh, they're completely focused on economics. Yeah. But, 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 you know, if a frequent criticism of game theory, and, you know, this is probably not a valid criticism because what you said is that the aim is not to necessarily predict anything, but a lot of people give this criticism that it's just an intellectual exercise, that we can't really use it. For yeah, anything. I heard that. Yeah. Uh, my old nemesis, Nassim Taleb, says mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I saw you ask, uh, I'll talk about Taleb for a minute because you mentioned him in your, in your letter to me. Um, I never met the man, but I did read his book, The Black Swan, mm -hmm. um, and I hated it. <laughs> Not that he was wrong about the importance of um outliers you know, right. things like 9 11 or pandemics or wars he's right about that mm -hmm. and he's right that you can't predict I, this is a central point you can't predict how society is going to develop yeah. i've worked my whole life on this i can tell you a lot about social society mm -hmm. but the dynamics of social change is almost impenetrable it, it's there philip tetlack has worked on this too a very famous uh uh statistician at MIT, we just do not, one, once Winston Churchill once was asked, what do you think of Marx's theory of history? Marx's theory of history is kind of mechanical, mm -hmm. thesis, antithesis, synthesis. 
And Winston Churchill said, history is just one damn thing after another. <laughs> In other words, it doesn't have a logic. Right. So he's right about that. But yeah. what he says, the way he said it, this was right after, he wrote that book right after the 2008, you know, melt, financial meltdown. But then he says things like, well, statistics is useless. I have a whole row of statistics books that are totally useless. Mm-hmm. So you got to be kidding. Do you ever try to do engineering about stress and strain without talking about statistics? Do you do epidemiology without statistics? What do you mean statistics is, is nothing? We had a big fight. The first time and the only time in my life I ever flamed on the internet was to poor Nassim Taleb. And I did delete this and apologize. <laughs> so uh, what he said about game theory is just wrong. He doesn't know anything about it. Just talk. Cold War? Huh. NASA? I'm sorry. Rand Corporation was right at the central of U.S. Cold War policy. Mm-hmm. Drescher, who invented the prisoner's dilemma, was a game theorist. Um even today, I, I work for the CIA, a branch of the CIA, doing negotiation stuff with Iran. Mm-hmm. And I work with the uh, Air Force uh, research organization because they want to use game theory to understand how you deal with terrorism. Mm-hmm. And you're going to tell me it's useless. As I say, it's, if you want to study animal behavior, game theory is the way to go. Go to, go to the Alcock, the, the most popular book for uh, elementary animal behavior and you'll find out things like you know why crickets chirp and why crickets go in a circle around the chirper and all sorts of wonderful things why females of many uh, species tend to be very coy whereas the Mm -hmm. males are very uh forward why Mm -hmm. does that happen all of this is game theory um so i'd like to ask you you have dipped your finger into all kinds of branches of social science what advice would you have for students who are interested in a career in social science? Uh, well, the main thing is you should do what you like. Right. I mean, this is not a minor thing. I mean, yeah. I had a problem with that because I started out in mathematics. In fact, I was in Harvard's mathematics department in graduate school, mm-hmm. which is the most august department in the world. Yeah. But I didn't. I was in the SDS and I was in the Viet- anti-Vietnam and the, and the uh, women's movement and all that stuff. And I didn't like just talking about numbers. So I m- moved to economics, which I knew nothing about. Mm-hmm. And I was much happier in economics. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> that's the first thing. Don't do just something just because you're good at it. Do it because you like it. Uh, but don't forget, you still got to make a living. So yeah. that's, that's, other than that, you know, also, you should know if you're, a, you must be a high school student if you're thinking about this. Doing social research is not the same thing as uh, going on your social medium and, uh, you know, ranting and raving about uh, this and that. <laughs> it's not like that sure. at all. Yeah. After you get a PhD and you're around for a while, then you can rant and rave all you want. But by that time, you don't want to rant and rave anymore. You just want sure. to sit in your armchair and watch The Simpsons. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. I love <laughs> I love yeah, the you Simpsons. Love that, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, the old episodes. I do have a yeah. I have a question about something you said though. You said the dynamics of social change are pretty much impenetrable. Do you think that that's always going to be the case? Are we never going to be able to grasp anything about social dynamics? I mean, I know Peter people like Peter Turchin make uh uh make a have tried to make a stride in this direction. But do you think well, that this is an impossible project? Uh, he, actually, Peter Turchin is interesting. He's an old friend of mine, and I mm-hmm. love the work he does. But it's not really dynamic. What he does is what's called comparative static. Right. That is, he looks at different, like, empires. And he say, what do mm-hmm. they have in common? And what happened when they failed? Okay. And, uh, yeah, I think it's quite interesting. I am a little skeptical. Um, and the problem with that is, and I, as I say, I love his work, and it's very difficult work. But mm-hmm. you don't have a hell of a lot of observations. It's no. very hard to, to use historical observations when there's six of them. Mm-hmm. I think that research is interesting, but um, it, it, it covers a, a limited range of human behaviors. If someone says to me, look, when I was a young man or when I was a kid, 
being gay was about the worst thing you could happen to you. Mm -hmm. You get made fun of, you get put in jail. I mean, it was awful. Now it's it's so fine, you know. Mm -hmm. America, actually, the norm is same sex marriage. Half of my friends are gay. All that kind of stuff. How did that happen? But it didn't happen with abortion. The number of people who believe in abortion in the U.S. is the percentage is just the same as it was 50 years ago. Mm. About 50, 50. Yeah. If you, if you phrase the questions one way, you get 60, 40. And if you say, do you believe in killing babies? And, oh, no, no, I don't really believe in that. Unless they're making a lot of noise. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it is very, very hard. And uh, the reason is, is, see, I'm at the Santa Fe Institute. Santa mm-hmm. Fe Institute was started by physicists like Murray Gilman and, mm-hmm. and um, uh, economists like Ken Arrow. And their idea was that there are complex systems. When you study systems in graduate school in, in most fields, you study what are basically neoclassical sy- systems mm-hmm. in which you have smooth manifolds and you take derivatives everywhere and it's all very beautiful. But society and people and brains and they're not like that. They're complex. So mm-hmm. we call compl- complexity studies. And in complexity studies, um, we can go somewhere. For instance, I do a lot of computer programming. If I have a problem in social dynamics, I put it on the computer and I see how it works out. But I can't predict how it's going to work out. It's just a bunch of rules. Yeah. And when it does work out, it's very hard for me to figure out why it worked out. Mm-hmm. See, so uh, yeah, maybe maybe they will figure it out, but they have not figured it out. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can say we have a science of human behavior or something, but I don't. Uh, how people change over time? Let me put it this way: you, you know, when you study cosmology, you learn that around you all these galaxies and stars, it's all very lumpy and everything. But if you go out eight parsecs or something, everything's the same. It's all. Mm-hmm uniform it's isotropic and homogeneous and yeah. theories are very 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 good mm-hmm. well it's kind of the same thing with uh, human society we can mm-hmm. enlarge seed things for instance modernity after the industrial revolution in england or maybe the enlightenment in, uh, in italy you can see a steady progress of new technology new social organization more differentiated institutions. And this happens all over the world. And it's still happening. And that we can predict. But we can't predict it in detail. The, l- the little parts are, uh, you know, you get Arab Spring. Yeah. Where democracy is pushed, and then there's a big pushback, and they're worse off than they were in the 15th century, mm-hmm. or the 14th century. So um, the, it's, it's in the narrow things. Foot binding in China. It lasted mm-hmm, for a right. thousand years. It disappeared in 25 years. Why? Yeah. Nobody knows. I mean, there are theories. I've studied those theories, and there are a lot mm-hmm. of interesting points. Things happen. Mm-hmm. You know, so I am very, uh, I'm not saying you shouldn't study dynamics. You should. But, you know, it's a very, very difficult subject. You know, Einstein once said that I don't do social science, it's too hard. You know, physics is wow. easy compared to this stuff. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, you have an equation yeah. for an, uh, an electron. It works every goddamn time. Yeah. Every time Dirac's model for the electron works. Every electron is just like every other electron. Mm-hmm. In fact, it's, I'm not just saying that kind of poetically. The statistics, the so-called Bose-Einstein statistics, are based on the fact if you take two electrons and switch them, it's the same. Hmm. Whereas the rock fairy are like billiard balls. Change two, you got change billiard balls. So physics is so, I'm not saying physics is easy, it's very hard. In fact, mathematically, it's much harder than the social sciences, but it's easier to get results that you can then verify in the field and verify experimentally. In the social sciences, it's very hard to do that. So, so that sounds like a pretty daunting task. Well, I love yeah. it. I mean, yeah. look, as I said, yeah. when we do gay theory. I have figured some things out. My, me and my, my colleagues and I have mm. figured some things out 
that are incredibly important for understanding human behavior mm -hmm. and nobody talked about before. Again, I'm talking about retribution and its centrality. We call it strong reciprocity. Yeah. And also altruism. Notice this. People don't even know. It's very hard to understand how altruistic people are. Let me give you an example. If people were selfish, we couldn't run a democracy because no one, no one would vote. No election in America has been decided by one vote, or America or any other English-speaking country has been decided by one vote since 1840. Wow. So, if, so does your vote count? No. If you had stayed home, the same person would have won. Mm -hmm. If you had voted for the other guy, the same person would have won. So why do you vote? You don't vote because you're selfish. You say, well, he wants to vote for, you know, the upper elites or for the working class. Well, that's not selfish. Working for a group that you're a part of is exactly what's, what's sure. altruistic. Yeah. So um, the fact that people vote, and by the way, if you ask people, why do you vote? They say, because I want this guy to win. Mm -hmm. And then I say, I've done this in a, in a, in a line uh, for voting. I say, but um, do you think your vote's going to make a difference? One vote? No. Well, then why bother voting? Because one vote's not going to matter. They say, if everybody thought that, we couldn't have a democracy. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, everybody doesn't think that. That's just play why you vote. And then if, if you go farther than that, you better pick on a little old lady rather than a big <laughs> uh, iron worker because they get very angry at you. <laughs> yeah. It's very sure, hard yeah. to explain to people that it's al altruistic to vote. Yeah. So humans are not only altruistic and vindictive, good, bad, they are... All the underpinnings of our society are based on people being both altruistic and being vindictive. Because you can't depend on the government. In my building here in, in Dumbo in Brooklyn, everybody wears a mask. Mm -hmm. The first time I forgot to wear a mask, it was very early. I would never forget that. I got in the elevator. I got screamed at by this guy who said, you son of a bitch, what are you coming on the elevator for without a mask? <laughs> yes. What mask? I don't have a mask. But I didn't forget that. I never got on the elevator again without a bandana yeah. or a mask. So most social control doesn't occur through the government. Most social control occurs through people rewarding people who are nice to them and punishing people who are not nice to them. Mm -hmm. So we learned this. So these, I'm not saying you don't learn anything by doing social theory. You learn a lot. It's still almost impossible to predict. And if I have time, let me go back to Nassim. Talent. Sure. In his book, The Black Swan, he says science is supposed to predict, but look how they couldn't predict, you know, 9-11, and look how they couldn't predict uh, the meltdown, and look how they couldn't predict this and that. The fact is science isn't about predicting, usually. It's about explaining and dealing with. Mm -hmm. Explaining means explaining how things work. Dealing with means when something happens, what do you do? For instance, I can't predict when my car is going to go over a pothole. I can't predict that. No. The engineers of the car can't predict that. But they can say, if you go over a pothole, you have shock absorbers, mm -hmm. which if the pothole is not too big, will protect your car. Yeah. That's what we can do with science. Not, and think of biology. But you think a bio, an evolutionary biologist can predict a frog or a caterpillar or a you know, hawk. No, mm -hmm. you don't predict. You can't predict how random mutations are going to turn out into new species. Mm -hmm. it doesn't mean it doesn't explain a lot of stuff. It's extremely powerful uh, uh, Darwinian evolutionary biology. It explains by looking how patterns change over time in species. So anyway, I think that, uh, that, that that's basically my point. If you can explain, it's good. It's like when you learn how to, to sail a boat, you don't learn how to predict what's going to happen to the weather. Mm -hmm. You listen to the weather station for that. Mm -hmm. You know in any situation what you have to do to make the boat go where you want it to go. And that's what science does for you. It allows you to deal with uncertainty in a somewhat optimal way. It's very interesting. So we're coming towards the end now, and I'd like to ask you, uh, where can we follow you and follow your work and where can we find you? Do you have Twitter? Do you have a blog? I know you have some Amazon reviews that you frequently update. 
I have 350 Amazon reviews, all serious. Uh, well, yeah. once in a while, you know, I'll do my ear, nose plugs or something. But they're all <laughs> serious reviews of serious books. And uh, Amazon, you, if you ever want to find out, take a book that's like social science or physics or something, and then uh, Google Gintis reviews such and such. Mm -hmm. I used to have, uh, Amazon used to allow you to keep them all together. But I haven't figured out how to do that. Mm -hmm. they, 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 the, the link got broken. So anybody out there who knows how to, uh, to do it, please uh, email me. Now, Google me, Gintis, and you, you'll get me. And I have a wonderful website with uh, lots of articles and really interesting stuff. So um, that you can get by Googling Gintis website. And I'll put that all in the link to the description below. Uh, sure. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gintis. This has been a fascinating talk, fascinating discussion. I really appreciate you coming on here. Great. It's nice to talk to you. Have a good one and stay safe. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.